Hi everybody, um, so I'm Catherine. I'm a grad student in the physics department at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm a condensed matter theorist. So today I'm going to explain a little bit about what I do, um, like the actual algorithms we use in condensed matter theory, uh, and then explain why we've been using Julia and switching from C++. Um, so hopefully by the end of the talk you'll understand a little bit more about CMT and also why Julia is completely awesome. Um, and if somebody in the field asks you about it later, you'll be totally prepared to, to explain to them why they should absolutely switch to Julia today. Um, so I'm on GitHub as KS Hyatt. Some of you might know me from there. Um, so maybe the first question a lot of people have about this talk title is what does quantum and statistical mean here? Um, so in condensed matter physics, we're really looking at a situation we have many electrons interacting. So for example, in a metal or in a superconductor, you have like 10 to the 23 electrons interacting with each other. Um, and quantum effects between these electrons are really important. Uh, and the guiding principle of the condensed matter field is this quote from P.W. Anderson, who's like kind of the, uh, I guess like the emperor of condensed matter, which is that more is different. Uh, that when electrons get together, they have collective excitations that are really surprising, that you really would not be able to predict if you would only ever study like an electron trapped, one electron trapped in a quantum well. Um, groups of electrons interacting with each other support a really amazing variety of different phases. For example, superconductors, which is this little picture here of YBCO levitating above a magnet, um, but also other really interesting phases like topological insulators. Um, Sorry. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a theorist, so I actually don't know how microphones work um, or any experimental apparatus. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, if you didn't hear that, basically we have a huge group of electrons interacting with each other, um, and they can do all kinds of stuff that is really surprising. Um, and generally, generically, if you just kind of like sit down and, and try and rely on your intuition, you won't predict what's going to happen. Um, and the other thing that makes these problems really interesting is that in a quantum system, the relevant Hilbert space grows really, really quickly. Um, and you don't know the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, which is going to control what phase the system is in. Um, and because the Hilbert space is so huge, the eigenbasis is really hard to find. So you have a set of really hard problems that support a bunch of really interesting results, um, which is like basically catnip, I guess, to, uh, to physicists everywhere. Um, so luckily, it's not the end of the world that the Hilbert space is so big, because most of the interesting physics that we care about happens at relatively low temperature. Um, and at low temperature, the lowest energy eigenstate is usually the most important one. Um, so this state is called the ground state. Uh, and we devised lots and lots of numerical techniques to approximate the ground state. Um, and once you have the ground state, you can calculate any observable that you can measure in a lab that you would ever be interested in. Um, so most interesting systems in condensed matter nowadays have really strong interactions between their constituents. And that means that our usual pen and paper techniques like quantum field theory often don't work so well. Uh, so we need to use the computer to get results. Uh, and the goal of the simulation usually is to find some observable like the specific heat or the magnetization or something else that we can compare with either an experiment or some theory that somebody has calculated and see, for instance, whether the, like, the quantum field theory somebody came up with is the relevant quantum field theory for this specific material. Uh, so the upshot is that doing simulations on the computer of these huge systems is becoming more and more important in the field. Um, and being able to do them well is now like a really relevant skill for a lot of physicists. So how actually do we find the ground state? Um, so in our group, there are three main techniques we can use. There's density matrix renormalization group, which I'll explain more about, quantum Monte Carlo, which I'll also explain, and exact diagonalization. So there's lots of other techniques that people use. Um, for instance, density functional theory is really, really big. Um, dynamic mean field theory is another one. There's a whole zoo of techniques, but I'm going to focus on three that are the ones I actually have experience with. Okay. So what is density matrix renormalization group, or DMRG? Uh, so in one dimension, we can always represent the ground state wave function as what's called a matrix product state. So you have a matrix on each site that represents the possible quantum configurations of whatever is on that site. And then we can sweep through the system, optimizing each of the matrices towards the MPS that represents the ground state. Uh, so this is the most powerful numerical procedure we have in 1D. You can actually simulate a system that has infinite length, um, which is kind of surprising, which really allows you to make a lot of important connections with theory and experiment. 
Uh, and most of the time is spent in linear algebra, doing like eigenstate factorizations or SVD or Kronecker products. Um, so here are some examples of what you can actually calculate in DMRG. So this uh, on the top here is an example where somebody calculated the central charge, um, which is a really important quantity in conformal field theory. So you can make a connection with like really, really powerful pen and paper results that people have gotten and determine that actually, yes, the conformal field theory you think is the correct one for this model. Um, you can determine what universality class the model is in. And from there, get like all of the scaling exponents, everything you would ever want to know about this model. Um, you can calculate phase diagrams, which are also really important um, and really interesting, for instance, for experiment. Like you can determine with the MRG whether the system supports the superfluid phase or not. Um, all sorts of things that are really, really important, both theoretically and for like experimental industrial uses. Uh, and the other main technique we use is quantum Monte Carlo. Um, so there's a whole zoo of these techniques. Um, there's all kinds of Monte Carlos one can do. Uh, so the, the main insight of Monte Carlo is that you have a huge configuration space. Um, so that might seem intractable at first, but actually most things in, in the configuration space are totally irrelevant. They don't matter. It's only a really small portion of the possible states that actually contribute to anything. Um, and this configuration space could be eigenstates, it could be Feynman diagrams, it could be Slater determinants, it could be a bunch of things. But in all of these cases, you can use Monte Carlo if most of them are irrelevant and you have some technique to find the most important ones, which is what we have. Uh, so what we do is we take samples, stochastically update them, and calculate observables. So for instance, these guys, these pictures, are structure factors. So if I took a material and I bombarded it with neutrons, I'd see something like this guy on the bottom, if I had what's called the charge density wave, which is an ordered phase, or you can have some kind of strange quantum fluid like on the top. Uh, but with quantum Monte Carlo, you can easily calculate observables in 2D and 3D, which have controlled errors, and which are something that you can directly compare with an experiment, um, which is why it's really relevant for us. And the other thing that's really great about most QMCs is that you can run them in parallel very often, um, which I'll talk more about in a second. Uh, but often these algorithms can actually run on huge system sizes very quickly if you are good at parallel programming, um, which is a big if, but it's possible to do. Uh, and occasionally some of them are also very linear algebra heavy because they rely directly on matrix vector multiplications or com computing determinants or updating determinants or other horrible linear algebra things that one might want to do. So as an example, um, one technique that I use quite a bit is called projector Monte Carlo, uh, which sounds really fancy. But essentially what it is, is I guess a vector and then I multiply a matrix by it many times. Um, so it's actually an example of physicists taking something that's really conceptually not that complicated and giving it a really fancy name so that we sound like we know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> but essentially all, all I have is a, is a big vector in the Hilbert space and I'm gonna update that vector by multiplying it with a matrix. Um, so the matrix, the Hamiltonian, is really, really big so I actually can't store it explicitly but I have a way to update the elements of the vector. Um, so these elements, because we like to invent our own terminology for things that already had names, are called walkers. Um, so I have like, let's say a million of them spread across many nodes. Um, and because we're doing Monte Carlo, the assumption is that some of these elements contribute way more to whatever's observable I want to measure than others. So for example, um, after about 20 updates in my code, so the weights of some walkers can be like 15 orders of magnitude higher uh, than other guys. So it's important to focus on the most, Im most important walkers that contribute. Um, the other problem, of course, is that if you're trying to take an average over floating point numbers where their magnitudes can differ by like 20 orders of magnitude, your error bars are going to be really, really huge. Um, so we like to focus on what's most important in the simulation. And to do that, we need to resample the probability distribution. Um, and doing that is called rebalancing because, again, we need to come up with a fancy name for something that already had a name. Um, so the nodes have to do a scan and or cumulative sum, whatever you want to call it, across the weight of the walkers, determine which walkers are going to go to which node, exchange the state of the walkers and the history of that walker, since the history is actually also important for various reasons in this technique. Um, so I actually have written this. It's about 200 lines of C++ in my code. Um, and if you try and show it to somebody who doesn't do this for a living, they just kind of bounce off of it like Teflon. Uh, they look at it and they look really distressed. And you have the pseudocode next to it, and they just, they just kind of like walk away. They don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, 
But this is something that's actually, like, if you think about it for a second, a really natural candidate for the kind of parallelism that's inherent in Julia. Um, so whenever distributed arrays actually get uh, a cumulative sum wrapper, which they need, um, <laughs> then this would be like really, really easy to write in Julia. Um, and it's also just like much easier to reason about um, just because of the way DRAs are built. So this is an example of a technique um, that's going to become a lot easier in condensed matter when Julia matures. Um, so the last thing we do is exact diagonalization, which is also pretty simple. We just want to calculate the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix, which is like the oldest linear algebra problem in the world. Everybody knows how to do it. You just use Lanchow's. Um, it's easy to implement and teach somebody to do it. Uh, but the downside is that because the Hilbert space grows exponentially, you can only access really small system sizes. Um, and in condensed matter theory, our goal is always to extrapolate to the infinite system, um, which is in our case called the thermodynamic limit. And that's really hard to do if the biggest system size you can access is 48 sites. Uh, so that's the biggest exact diagonalization calculation that's ever been done in condensed matter that exploited a huge number of symmetries in the problem. Uh, and as a comparison, the biggest quantum Monte Carlo has used like many thousands of sites. Uh, so exact diagonalization is really great because you can get exact answers, but it, it doesn't scale to the sizes we need. So we have to use these funky either Monte Carlo or, um, or DMRG algorithms to really make progress in this field. Uh, and this is kind of a problem for condensed matter physicists because most people in physics do not have a lot of CS education. Um, it's very uncommon for people to know how to code at all, actually. Um, and most people who are physicists went into physics to do physics, not learn C++. Um, and for them, running code in Fortran, which is kind of sadly still a standard, or C++ is really, really hard. It's hard for them to learn. It's hard for them to write good code. It's hard for them to write fast code. And it's especially hard for them to write code that other people can use. Um, I think everyone in this field has a horror story about opening up like a 10,000 line Fortran file and just kind of looking at it and being like, nope, I'm going to do another project. <laughs> Uh, but there, I mean, there's lots of there's lots of groups that use these 10,000 line Fortran files that were written in like 1975 that have just been passed around between grad students, and they don't know what that file does. It puts they put a number in and a number comes out, um, and so there's been some some push to use Python in this field, which is great because it's much easier to teach people to use Python. But the problem is. It's not fast enough in a lot of cases for what we need. Um, for instance, PyPy, as far as I know, still doesn't have NumPy support. Um, writing parallel code in Python can be hard. Um, learning how to write parallel code in either Python or C++ is also really hard for a lot of physicists because they don't have a lot of training in CS. Uh, so the real, the real thing that physicists are looking for is something that's fast, that has a lot of library support, and is ideally easy to teach to people. Because the status quo right now is that like one to five percent of physicists know how to code well, or at least code decently. So they write an implementation of a DMRG or quantum Monte Carlo code, and that is a black box that gets passed around to everyone else. And those people just like press a button and the science comes out. But they don't understand internally how this algorithm works particularly well. It's hard for them to debug it. It's hard for them, like if you sit somebody down and you're like, explain to me with like pictures how DMRG works, they can't do it. Um, they're just hoping, like fingers crossed, that the guy who wrote the DMRG knew what he was doing, um, which is not an ideal situation. Um, but the thing we're really excited about is that Julia can change this. Um, most people in physics don't need the huge feature set of MPI and HDF5, and even most of C++. Like, most people don't need to be doing pointer arithmetic or like, all the crazy optimization stuff you can do in C++. They need 80% like, of the speed, which you can get in Julia. Um, you don't even need parity with C++ for people to switch. Uh, and we want something that's like Python in terms of ease, but not like Python in terms of speed. Uh, that's the goal. And I don't mean to slam Python here at all, because it is a great and wonderful language, but it really is not meeting the needs of the community right now. And it, part of the reason that people don't learn numerics is learning these algorithms in C++ can take somebody over a year, sometimes two. Many of them have never programmed before, so they're learning C++ or Fortran at the same time as they're trying to learn this algorithm, and it's, it's just a disaster. They spend two years of their life learning this thing, and they write this code that's like spaghetti-coded. There's like 
objects with 200 methods all over the place. It's just really not good. Um, so what we want to do is make it much easier for people to use numerics because it's becoming more and more important. And there's a huge group of people who are shut out of it right now because there's no language that meets their needs. Uh, because they, they really have n not a huge amount of interest in learning like move semantics or getting around the GIL or whatever. Uh, they just want something that's fast, that's easy, and has libraries, which sounds like Julia to me and to them, actually, if you tell them about it. And one thing that actually is a huge advantage over Python is all the parallel features of Julia. This is something that we really emphasize to people when we talk to them in physics, uh, that doing parallel computing is, is a lot easier. Um, there's obviously distributed arrays, um, the MPI wrapper, which uh, is having more and more things added, um, is really great. Uh, Cluster managing is actually really easy, which is something that not everyone thinks about, but is actually really important. So for instance, I run on four different clusters right now. Um, so one of them has 20,000 nodes. Each one has 32 cores. So I'm not really running Julia on that right now. So that's running a pretty new version of Cray Linux. I have another cluster on campus that has about 120 nodes. It's running Red Hat 6. And then there's another cluster, which is like on some like 10-year-old CPU architecture that was running Red Hat 4 until three months ago. Um, so Julia's ability to support all kinds of different clusters, mostly painlessly, is something that people are actually really interested in because uh, the other problem, of course, with using C++ is that, so you give someone your code and they're like, excellent, I'm gonna use this code to do science, this is so great. The only problem is that you're using a C++ 11 feature. And then they go to this cluster that's running Red Hat 4, and like the last GCC it supports is like 4.2, which didn't have C++ 11 support because C++ didn't, 11 didn't exist at that point. And so they're sitting there being like, hello, can you please remove all of the C++ 11 features from this code? Uh, and you sit there and you say, no, no, I can't do that. Um, and also I don't want to, but I can't do it. <laughs> Uh, and, th and this actually happens to people a lot, and it's really frustrating. And this is a huge reason that people avoid numerics, both because it's hard to learn, and because right now the ecosystem is just extremely frustrating. Um, another example is that like, a huge amount of clusters have weird custom compiled versions of HDF5 on them. Um, people run into bugs a lot because of this. And the whole situation is just totally ripe for somebody to come in and just disrupt it. Um, with new technology that can make people use numerics and use it well. Uh, so our group has been using Julia for about a year. Uh, one thing that we really, really like about it actually is there's a, there's a lot of people in our field in condensed matter theory who, who know that numerics exists and they value numericists because we can get numbers for them on things they can't calculate themselves, but they really just have no idea how like, quantum Monte Carlo works. Like, they have no idea what the limitations of it are, what it can and cannot do. Um, they don't know how D DMRG works, so they also don't know like, how long you should expect it to run, what is the convergence supposed to be, all of these things they just don't know. And the easiest way to teach them that is to explain on some level how the algorithm works. And doing that is really easy with Julia code. Uh, our experience has been that if you just sit somebody down, you're like, here's our DMRG Julia code. And they look at it, and they look at like, some very pseudo-coding explanation of how DMRG works, and they actually get what the computer is doing, which is a really new experience for people. Um, if you try and do this with, with C++ or Fortran, it's really hard, because then they get stuck on these like, thousand line functions to do all these MPI calls, passing stuff around, or doing point arithmetic, and it's hard for them to map that code to their understanding on some level of like, I multiply the Hamiltonian by the wave function, and then this cat comes out, and then I measure an operator. Whereas in Julia, it's so much easier to communicate what the code is actually doing in your mental map of like, how quantum mechanics works. Uh, so this is something that we, we really like from a communication perspective. It's making it much easier for us to communicate with people who aren't necessarily numerics experts but are interested in numerics, which is a really big part of the condensed matter theory community. The other thing that's great is that usually uh, what you would do when you were learning an algorithm, if you didn't know it really well or you didn't feel confident about your C skills, was you would write a Python implementation and you'd make sure it worked. And so you'd get some numbers out that you could compare with. And that would be your learning the algorithm code. And then you'd write another code that was the production code in C++. And then you'd compare your numbers to make sure you did it correctly. Um, and that production code would be your box that you press buttons on. And occasionally the science comes out. Most of the time you're wrong because science is hard. But occasionally you would get the right answer. Um, so we've, we've stopped duplicating code bases. 
uh, we just write one code in Julia that's usually like OK for speed. And that's our learning the algorithm code. And then we tweak it a little bit. And that becomes the fast production code that does almost everything we need. It's reasonably quick. Um, and we can use to talk to people, uh, which is just amazing for us. The other thing that we're really interested in um, is the, the ge like GPU programming. This is kind of like a, a really big trend in scientific computing right now because huge numbers of these algorithms like Quantum Monte Carlo are really parallelizable. Um, because it's, most of them are fancy names for big linear algebra operations, uh, the GPU is a natural choice. Um, but even more so than just regular C or C++ programming, this is something that's really hard for scientists to learn. Um, and so your option was do what someone did to me, which was force some, some foolish student to learn this and write this like blob that nobody else could use, or hire a CS major who doesn't understand any of the physics and who you can't really communicate with. Um, <laughs> which is fine. I mean, you can teach them the physics. But you would like to have them running from, from day one on actually like implementing the thing, rather than having them spend six, six months learning like quantum field theory or like the theory of metals or whatever it is you want them to learn. Um, so we're, we're really excited because it seems like in the next year or two, the GPU support in Julia is going to become much more mature. And that'll make it much easier for us to write kernels and for other people to do it and harness the power of these um, of, of the GPU. Because right now, there's a huge number of, of clusters that you can use with GPUs, but almost nobody uses them because it's just too hard. Uh, and so the government and industry have invested in all this infrastructure that's just not being exploited right now, but really could help us actually like make important discoveries in science, but we just can't right now because most people don't know how to program well enough to use them. And it's a really frustrating situation for everyone. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we use a huge number of different clusters. And Julia makes that really, really easy. Uh, another thing about actually using different clusters, which I didn't mention, uh, is that I don't know what the best way to say this is, actually. Um, the uh, People often are so new to numerics that they don't n know things like just because you compiled the C++ binary on one system doesn't mean you can just run it somewhere else because they just have no experience. Um, and of course, they, sh they should learn that quickly. Um, but often what they do is they try and you know there's psych faults everywhere and it doesn't work. Um, or it complains about having the wrong std lib or whatever. And they just get so angry that they give up. Um, and then they hate numerics forever and they don't want to use it. Um, so having something that's, that's reasonably easy to use on different platforms is actually a really, really good tool, we think, for evangelizing to people. Uh, and Julia is awesome for that. And the other thing that's really great about it is that the library support is already so amazing. There's already so much you can do with linear algebra, with HDF5, um, with parallelism, that people can just, can just basically like, just go. They can just call SVD and they're done. Um, Currently, what people are doing is they're, they're sitting down and they're like, all right, so we have to write a DMRG. So first, they spend like 30 minutes learning how to call Eigen. And then they do that wrong for like three weeks. And then they finally learn how to call Eigen's SVD. And, and now they're ready to start doing the actual hard part of the coding, which is like gluing all the SVDs together correctly. Um, whereas in Julia, this is like way easier, because somebody already, one person figured that out one time for you. And it's easy to go and look at that code and be like, ah, I see what, what's going on here. I understand. Uh, so kind of, a, kind of a summary of the situation for us is that writing code and teaching people how the code works, teaching people algorithms for condensed matter in Julia is, is just way better uh, than the previous situation in our field. Uh, sim like reasoning about quantum mechanics is hard enough that if we can make it simpler to actually represent what's going on in code, that will be a huge step forward for people. Uh, and the condensed matter community is excited about Julia. Uh, people have started coming up to me at work being like, so I was at DAMOP, which is the, uh, the Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Conference. There's like probably like 10,000 people there every year. And you know, people were just talking about Julia. Can you tell me about it? What is it? Um, so there is, there is buzz for Julia in the community. People, people's impression of it is that it, it's like somehow like this holy grail of fast and easy to learn, which happens to be true, which is always nice <laughs> when that actually <laughs> happens to people. Um, 
People are especially excited about the parallel features. And the other thing that is kind of like, I think, morally really good is we can, we can get out of this situation where a very small group of people are writing all the code, and then somebody else is just pressing buttons and like praying that it works. Uh, we really want a situation where everyone, or almost everyone, can understand what's going on in the numerics code they're using. Um, I think scientifically it's a bad situation when you have a group of people who are using something that they just they really don't understand. This is a situation that like people would not tolerate pen and paper. Like you wouldn't have a student who is is just like somehow pressing someone else's quantum field theory button, just hoping that that calculation is true, um, or like begging a postdoc to do that for them, and then you say like, oh, okay, so you you computed the Green's function. How did you do it? Like, what did you approximate? And they just say, I don't know. Uh, Doctor whatever did it. Uh, really hope this is right. Anyway, let's go submit this to science. Uh, <laughs> like that, that's something that people wouldn't put up with and they don't, but for some reason it's become acceptable in numerics. And I think part of the reason for that is just that the status quo is that people correctly view learning C and C++ and Fortran is really hard. Um, they think it's not worth their time to learn numerics, um, but Julia can absolutely change that. And it'll make it a lot easier for us to handle these huge quantum systems that have a really, really interesting array of just all kinds of crazy stuff that happens in them. Uh, so yeah, condensed matter theory is really excited about Julia. Um, and now you're ready if somebody in that field asks you, why is Julia great to tell them? <laughs> um, yeah, so questions? Um, yeah, so, so most of the clusters I run on are using PBS or Torque, if people know what that is. Um, do you want me to explain what that is? Yes, yes okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I guess I'm just going to start from the basics here, so, so please don't feel insulted at all. Uh, so normally what happens on, on, on the cluster is you have like, like, let's say 300 people all logged in at once, and we all want to run jobs, right? But there's only like 50 nodes. Uh, so instead you submit a job to the scheduler. So you say, like, submit this job, which is just a bash script that will run your code. And the bash script is like MPI run on some number of things. And it's going to run for this amount of time, my job, um, which is like do the exact diagonalization, for instance. Uh, so then, then the scheduler kind of chills out for a while, puts you in a queue, and runs the job. So it's a little bit, it's essentially like the way that Travis works, for instance, on GitHub, um, except you can ask for, like, I think the biggest job I've ever asked for on on PBS or Torque was um, 5,000 nodes. It might have been bigger than that. Um, so you can ask for a really big number. Uh, and then you know, you're in the scheduler, it runs your job, and you tell it like write out to these hard disks, and it does, and you can, look at the, you can look at your data later, and it'll alert you, for instance, when the job is done running. Um, so PBS is the main one in, in science. Uh, it runs on most of these clusters, uh, and you can set it up to like ask for, like you can put RAM limits or all kinds of things on it. Uh, but the biggest difference between clusters is a lot of these things are custom ordered, like from Cray or from from some other company. Uh, so they're using like some some custom, for instance, like CPU architecture. Like sometimes the nodes, like the CPU nodes will have one CPU architecture and the GPU nodes will have a different one. Um, which is something that Julia supports, but is like really, really frustrating if you're trying to use C++ and you have to compile for one CPU if you're running the CPU job, but then the GPU thing has to be compiled differently and it, it's awful. Uh, and you then have to, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of these things are also running like different, different operating systems, which is a problem. Um, some of them will have, have different like they'll have different libraries installed on different nodes. Like the GPU nodes will have older versions of libraries than the CPU nodes, which is a problem I've run into before, um, which is not as much of an issue with Julia, but is obviously a huge issue if you're like linking against the library for C++. Um, some of them, yeah, so there's this like obvious issue where one is running Red Hat 4 and the other one's running like Red Hat, whatever the newest version is, which is also a very frustrating situation, except in Julia it's easy. Um, and of course, I mean, I didn't really talk about this as much, but you can, you can use your own cluster manager to like, kind of hint to the scheduler what you want to do in Julia um, to provide kind of like a, 
a Julia specific way of like asking for nodes in a certain topology or whatever, which is really nice. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> So it, it depends, actually. So, I mean, if we want the ground state, then you only need the ground state. Um, the so that it's recorded? Oh, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, so, so he asked, uh, when we do exact analyzation, do we want a large fraction of the modes or just one? Yeah, so, so if we want the ground state, then we just want one, and that's like the easiest land trust case. But there are systems, uh, actually, so this is what my research is on right now, where we want a very large fraction of the modes in the middle of the spectrum, which is hard. Um, and then you have to do like these shift and invert things. Um, and it's a real pain. Uh, and so the other thing, I guess, I don't know if this is true in other fields because I don't know as much about them, but in a, in a quantum system, um, we want states with what are called, what's called finite energy density. So the spacing between levels becomes like exponentially small in the system size. Uh, and so solving the eigenvalue problem to find these eigenstates is really, really hard. And you, you need the eigenstate exactly. You can't, you can't be off by a bit, because if you have overlap between the states, then for the specific problems we're studying, your, your results are basically all going to be garbage. Um. So is a large fraction like 10% or So usually, um, usually what we do is instead of like talking in percents, this is kind of like a bad thing, we pick a target energy and we ask for like, give me the 500 states closest to that. Uh, and then, um, so in these systems, the systems are disordered. So there's some kind of random potential on each site, and then we run like a thousand disorder realizations, so a thousand different configurations of the disorder, and then grab 500 eigenstates and compute statistics on that. Um, so it becomes it becomes somehow like a little bit easier as you go bigger because you don't need as big of a fraction, but because the Hamiltonian itself is really really big, doing the like doing the preconditioning becomes much harder. Does that answer your question? Does Julia have an impact on peer review over time in terms of being able to examine the science that's going on and to make determinations about whether your Julia focus is correct? So the question was whether Julia is going to have an impact on peer review. Um, so I think, like right now, the, si the situation is like, so I'll run my Quantum Monte Carlo, which is, for, it's, so this is a code that I have. Um, it's what generated, where are my pictures? Uh, so these, these two pictures right here are actually from my code. My code made these. Um, so it's about like 5,000 lines of C++. So normally if you, so the big journals that we use in physics are physical review. Um, so you will usually submit to physical review letters, which is like the really awesome one, or physical review B, which is the condensed matter one. So neither of those, as far as I know, require you to open source your code. Um, like I can just say, I use this algorithm and provide like no other information, especially not the code, and, and, and that's, that's absolutely acceptable. Like I don't have to provide what parameters I ran it with, or how many walkers, or really anything. Um, and that's not a good situation. It makes re reproducing other people's work really hard, uh, which is a problem that we actually had with these pictures. Um, because if, if they don't tell you what parameters they use, like you just gotta kind of guess. Um, or ask them and sometimes people don't wanna tell you. Uh, so I think one reason that has happened is because most people in the field can't read C++ and also the journals feel like it's not reasonable to ask people to open source their like 20,000 lines of whatever. Um, whereas in Julia, you can write things that are much less verbose, but it's actually much easier for people to understand, as I talked about. So I think that it will help drive this trend of journals requiring people to make their source code available. And that will actually help peer review a lot, because there have been many cases where people had the very subtle bug that they didn't realize that made all their results wrong. And that might have been caught earlier if they had open sourced their C++, but maybe not, because of course, in open source, we often rely on the many eyes problem, uh, where you know you have a huge number of eyes looking at the code and they catch the bug. But in scientific computing, you don't have a lot of eyes uh, that can read the code. So even if you open source it, you may not catch it right now. But I think if we can get people to use Julia, we'll have a huge, we'll have both more code open sourced and a vast, vastly larger group of eyes to look at it to kind of catch the problem. Can I give a kind of answer? 
<laughs> so the very tone of the question and the answer was that the paper is the primary. And the code is, oh yeah, you do that and you report about it. And for sure, that balance is going to shift. Yeah. So that the code becomes more of the primary. I mean, people, people in physics do occasionally publish, like, we now have this library which you can use, and it does this and this, and the co source code is available there. But those publications, I think, are viewed as less impactful than somewhere out there, there exists some code that I ran, here's the answer. Um, and I, I personally hope that that changes, and I also think for science it'll be better if that changes. First of all, I think, uh, and this might have already been said many times, but thanks a lot for all the crazy amount of press coverage. <laughs> That's actually how I procrastinate. When I don't want to work on research on my slides, I just test. <laughs> so you, you've, been, you, you've been in parts of the Julia Code base uh, that you know, probably many haven't. And you, you said all the good things you know, that Julia has to offer to the CMT community. But if you had to pick a couple of things that we are not so great, like, you know, what, or maybe more, what would those things be? Like, if you have thoughts on the top of your mind. Um, I think, so I, I talked a bit about how, like, we're really excited about the parallel features, but what I really mean by that is we're excited about where they'll be in a year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I personally think that what exists right now is really cool, uh, but I think many people would agree that there's lots more features that would be great. Like, for instance, this cumulative sum thing. Um, on, like, DRA doesn't have a lot of methods implemented right now, and if it had more <laughs> methods, like, oh my gosh, you, that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, I think as more parallel features come online, it'll be even easier to get people to switch. The thing is, I mean, even, uh, like, it's a small minority of even the numerics people in CMT who are really interested in parallelism. Like, I feel like you're almost getting a distorted perspective by talking to me because I really like parallel features. Most people would, would just be overjoyed to have easy linear algebra. Um, that's most of what people are doing because DMRG and exact linearization are running on that. Um, it's mostly like the crazy quantum Monte Carlo people like me who really want the parallelism. Um, but once that happens, I think it'll be easier to get more people to do quantum Monte Carlo. So. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing, maybe. <laughs> Does that answer the yeah, question? Yeah. Uh, there's no more questions. Yes, thank you.